So in this episode, we're going to talk about jerks, scumbags, people that get under your skin. They could be family members. These could be people in society or culture, the homeless, addicts, drunks, criminals. People live in our heads. People live in our minds. We want to see other people change their actions. And it's a really big deal to our own mental health. Okay, so welcome. This is a show where I attempt to get to the deepest issues of life, but I don't leave you there. The goal here is to help people improve their relationships and get perhaps a, a deeper understanding of what's going on beyond the conventional memes and tropes and in many cases just add water techniques that we see especially on social media and we're going to go pretty deep today into human behavior i will say some of the content of this particular episode is going to be rather gruesome because i'm going to use a famous case of a serial murderer to get to this thing about jerks or assholes murderers or fiends people that live in our heads that we want to see changed. Before we get going, I would really humbly ask if you just click the subscribe button right now, if you turn your phone sideways sometimes, you'll see a red button there, and like the video. And I would love comments. I would love to hear more of your comments. This one's going to be more controversial. Some of you will dismiss it, but you're going to be intrigued, so let's get into it. So I want to start with the word vice. We have the word vicious referring to people who are really bad, the vicious murderer. But at the root, we have the word vice, which is simply one definition is an immoral or wicked personal characteristic. So a vicious person or a person with a vice has destructive behaviors and behaviors that are destructive, potentially self-destructive potentially destructive to others, or both. And when we look at the case today, we're certainly going to see somebody who had self-destructive behaviors as well as uh, other destructive behaviors. There's this whole range of vicious actions. We have, from the benign, we have facial gestures. Maybe a, a clerk makes as you're checking out, you know, Maybe you're taking too long and the guy behind you makes a face, facial gesture or sighs, a tone of voice perhaps from a friend or a coworker where you just know that the person's kind of being a jerk. We have theft, you know, so we're moving along this pendulum. Dry, we see a lot of <laughs> behavior when people are driving. Uh, someone cuts you off. Someone won't let you, you know, won't, won't let you over. And, and these people just seem to be kind of vicious. They're sadistic. They just seem to be getting pleasure out of making someone else miserable. There's vandalism. There's assault and battery, sexual assault, rape. We're moving along the line here. And then we have premeditated murder, first degree murder. And then, of course, genocide, where you have individuals that don't want to just kill one or a dozen, but actually want to wipe out an entire race or ethnicity. So we have this whole gamut of viciousness or vice in others. And this talk, it really applies to, to all of all of this, this, ho this whole gamut, because at the end of the day, it's these actions that we see in the lives of people around us, that we see in the lives of others in society that really get to us. And, and there's a political aspect as well to this. Like, I'm so frustrated that people believe this that they believe that abortion is okay or believe a, you know choice is that people shouldn't have choice that women shouldn't have choice and so this also ties into belief but the bottom line is that there are others in our lives that consume a lot of our time our mental energy because of their actions and the main axiom we have is that if they would only choose to change So I'm using this example because it is so stark and so vivid and is so descriptive. And ultimately, it's going to be a kind of a, if you will, perfect example to prove my, my conclusion that's going to come later. You're going to have to wait for it. But I'd like to introduce Robert Alton Harris. Harris was executed 
in 1992 at San Quentin. Uh, he was in high security prison, and he murdered two 16-year-old boys. Basically, him and his brother wanted to um, rob a bank, and so they needed a car, and they hijacked the car of these two 16-year-old boys. And they took the car out to a remote area. They told the boys, we're going to come back and bring you the car. And I'm reading now, as the two boys walked away, Harris slowly raised the Luger and shot one of the boys in the back. His brother Daniel said, Harris was with his brother Daniel. The boy yelled, oh God, and slumped to the ground. Harris chased the other boy down a hill and shot him four times. The first boy was still alive. When Harris came back up the hill, Harris put the gun to his head and fired. But here's the part that gets kind of more chilling, if you will. Later, as they were driving the car, Robert Harris, Alton Harris, offered his brother an apple turnover and began eating the hamburger of one of the boys he just murdered. And his brother reported later, Robert laughed at me, Daniel said. He said I was weak. He called me a sissy. And I said I didn't have the stomach for it. Harris smiled and told Daniel that it would be amusing if the two of them were to pose as police officers and inform the parents that their sons had just been killed. Harris later had his gun and he noticed blood stains and rem remnants of flesh on the barrel as a result of the point blank shot and said, quote, I really blew that guy's brains out. And, and then he started to laugh. Here you have an individual who is vicious uh, and sadistic by definition of the word vicious and sadistic. He didn't just murder. It wasn't just first degree murder, but he was so detached from the, the, the vile act of this murder that he actually relished in it. He ate a hamburger that had belonged to one of these boys without even thinking twice about it and joked about showing up and seeing the expression of the parents' faces when posed as police officers. They, so, so we're really dealing with somebody who is kind of an exemplar of a scumbag, and that word's gonna come back in a bit. But let's take a look at Robert Alton Harris just for a moment. So can you guess, can you take a stab in the dark at what Harris's life would have been like growing up? Now, I'm not excusing. It's very important because this will be a controversial later on. This is going to be highly controversial to some of you and very difficult for a group of you uh, to wrap your heads around. But can we take a guess at what Harris's life was like growing up? Do you think he went to an Ivy League plus college? Do you think he was the captain of the football team? Do you think that he had good grades and good extracurricular activities in high school and great letters of recommendation. Well, let's take a quick glimpse. Here's a description of his day of birth offered by his sister in a court declaration. Mother was bathing in the bathtub and father came in and started kicking her in the abdomen, screaming that it was not his baby. The mother fell into the bathtub he kicked her in the crotch with his combat boots, and she began hemorrhaging. He kicked her several more times. Thus, Robert was born three months premature. Mom was drunk, like Dad, and the fetal alcohol had taken its toll. Robert had tremors and sleep disorders. From the time of his birth, Robert was beaten by both parents virtually every day. Mom preferred bamboo sticks, Dad just used his knuckles. The sister described it this way. Robert couldn't walk into a room without father kicking or beating him. Father was convinced that Robert was sired by another man. When Robert would seek affection by rubbing against his mother's leg, dad would beat both Robert and the mother. Sometimes for no apparent reason, dad would load his guns and help tell his loved ones, there were like five or six kids, that they had 30 minutes to hide outside the house he then hunted his family like animals, promising to shoot anyone he found. This is a list of drugs ingested by Robert from the age of six through adolescence. Sniffing airplane glue, gasoline, oven cleaner, paint, typewriter, correction fluid, 
through ingestion, cocaine, heroin, orally, secondol, methamphetamines, PCP, and LSD. Robert had no friends. He had a speech impediment. Before he was a teenager, he revealed the pattern that would dominate his life. He started killing neighborhood pets. The need to destroy and hurt was directed at everything, including himself. Once mom told Robert and brother to get switches so she could beat them, the brother brought back a small twig. Robert brought back a club. And there's much more detail. This boy ended up in juvenile hall. He was raped. He attempted to kill himself as a teenager and began vicious actions, starting with himself, then merging to neighborhood pets. One time he stabbed a prize pig a thousand times as a young teenager, and then his viciousness became directed out toward others, concluding with the murder of these two boys. So I recently spent about five years working closely uh, with children like Robert. In, f in few cases, they would have been that severe, but children who end up in the foster care system, there are about a half a million of them. Children who are subject to uh, neglect, severe neglect, abuse uh, and abandonment. Uh, Robert was subject to all three. And it's important as kind of a, a, I guess if you will, a footnote to this talk to just say something very quickly about trauma. Trauma is a real physiological event. In the case of Robert, you had a boy with, with actual brain damage, if you will, brain abnormality because of the abuse beginning from the time uh, before he was actually born. And I wrote once that we treat the brain unlike any other organ in the human body. In fact, we treat the brain unlike any part of the body. If one has a damaged heart, we do surgery or take medicine or have special diets and exercise routines. There might even be a transplant. The same is true for lung disease or liver failure. And if we see a veteran with a severed leg or a child with muscular dystrophy, Feelings of empathy typically arise. And whether heart or lung or liver or severed leg or muscular dystrophy, we don't ever imagine the person could get over it or make a decision to change. Victims of family-induced childhood trauma or what's popularly called developmental trauma just can't heal their brain injuries, if you will, by trying harder any more than you can heal diabetes by wishful positive thoughts. So why can't the scumbag, why can't the jerk, why can't the asshole, whether it's again from the benign, the person that just needles away in a vicious way, whether it's small V or big V, but people bug the hell out of us. Why can't they simply change? And this is gonna be the challenge that I think many of you are going to struggle with, which I think is absolutely irrefutable. Robert Alton Harris had a vice. The person tailgating you, flipping you off for doing nothing, has a vice. They're acting viciously. So let's do a little experiment right now. Imagine for a second your own vice. That thing about yourself that you're not happy about. Now, it's not going to be murdering people, hopefully. I'm sure it's not. But the thing that you find yourself oftentimes lamenting about your own behavior, and we know what the big ones are. It could be procrastination. It could be overeating, overdrinking, some type of sexual addiction or sexual action that, you, that bring you shame, leave you feeling guilty, that you want to quit. It could be slandering or gossiping. It could be being judgmental or rude. But that thing, pick the thing, if you're religious and it's Lent, the thing you give up, and you give it up because you would like to give it up forever, but it's hard. So oftentimes what we do is we assume the people out there that we're frustrated with, the jerks, the assholes, the sadists, the vicious people, 
could simply by act of commitment or choice or decision change their actions. If we expect that they can do that simply by matter of choice, well then certainly we must believe that we can change our own actions, our own vices, by matter of choice or decision. But of course we can't, and we haven't been able to for the most part. And this gets to the mystery of what's called the philosophy of action in metaphysics in philosophy, which is action is a very uh, complex reality and change, changing behavior, or most certainly wishing others would change their behavior, is to a very large extent a futile undertaking. In the case of Harris, you clearly have somebody who, and I said this in a video recently, the video was titled, There Are No Such Thing as Jerks, who are prisons, we have two million prisoners today in our, in our prisons, two million. These people are in prison because they were convicted of crimes and overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, over 90% of them came from homes like Harris's home where there was neglect, abuse, and abandonment. Not always that severe, usually not that severe. But overwhelmingly, we know that the causes of academic failure, teenage pregnancy, poverty, illicit substance abuse, sex trafficking and prostitution, homelessness, incarceration, like I said, prisons, and then the long process of rehabilitation, those who are in that system come from homes like Harris. Conversely, those who do well in life, who end up at those Ivy League Plus schools, are cared for, nurtured, generally speaking, loved, supported by a parent or two parents, and sometimes an entire family. So bottom line is if we're unwilling, it's, it's, a, it's a choice. Remember, we're big on choices. A lot of you that aren't buying this are big on choices. They could just decide to change their mind. They could just decide to do good. They could just decide to walk the straight and narrow, kick the habit, right? We have a choice to look at people with mercy and empathy and understand the famous, might, might be a little bit thin, but that hurt people hurt people. Robert Alton Harris was a very hurt person. Should he have been in prison? Yes. Should he have been executed? No, because he was a sick man. We don't execute people with heart disease or cancer. And the last thing we need to talk about is a guy that lived a couple hundred years before Jesus, a few hundred years, named Socrates. This one will blow your mind as we close. So yes or no, was Robert Alton Harris ignorant? Because Socrates had this view that there's really no such thing as vice or viciousness or evil. All those things reduce to ignorance. For Socrates, the only thing that exists that causes pain is ignorance. It's been rejected, this viewpoint, by philosophers, but I still think is worth considering. Robert Alton Harris was certainly ignorant. He was ignorant of the, the inherent goodness of human life. He was ignorant of the sanctity of life for pets and others and himself as he was trying to uh, perhaps kill himself, ingesting these drugs, sniffing these drugs as a child, trying to commit suicide, and then pushing that viciousness outward. Socrates ultimately believed that it was ignorance that is the cause of all the evils in the world. I'm not necessarily agreeing with it, but I think it's worth considering for sure. I thank you for being part of this tough topic, and I hope the result of it is a greater compassion and understanding of all those other people out there that won't simply change their actions and who are bugging us. Do subscribe. This is a new video. It's a new channel. It's a new station. It's a new podcast. I just launched all of this a few months back. And I'm looking people who want to join the fight against 
ignorance, and injustice in the world. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you next time.